But welcome to uh, the I think third session of the um, uh, preparation for round one. Um, so remember that um, uh, you've got to do some of this yourself. Uh, you get to be an expert in problem solving by solving problems yourself, not by watching other people. But you can see, you can learn a lot by watching other people do some things, how they draw the diagram, are able to uh, actually come up with some ideas because they know things. So, uh, yes, I'm afraid that knowing stuff, learning stuff is actually quite a useful exercise, despite it being very old fashioned. So pencil and paper at the ready, uh, ready to write things down. You can't follow the algebra when someone else is doing it, but you can jot down the key points so that you can have a go yourself. You can so jump over the hurdles when you come up against them because you've seen just what's to be done. OK, so thank you very much, Dr. French. Hello. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to session three of the British Physics Olympiad round one training. Uh, a bit eagle eyes. Uh, perhaps you can put the uh, chat. What do you think A might be? Uh, a is by circular reasoning. Could do a comms check, Nina. Oh, sorry, Kim Lam. Uh, any any ideas in the chat? Uh, I don't see anything. <laughs> there we are. Then we'll have to can think about that. So uh, circular reading is one of my bad jokes. So there, we, if that you get inspired, what uh, that constant might be, you can let me know by the end. Uh, winner gets a well, an honourable mention. Right. So uh, tonight, uh, let's get uh, get stuck in. So we're going to keep following twenty twenty two again. And we're going to do problems G, S, C and H tonight. Um, so a bit of a mechanics vibe. So uh, let's go for the first one. Um, so scroll down and find them G. And we're going to start off with a, a tin of fluid. I quite like this question. So um, four marks. And actually, I think quite an easy one, actually. Uh, nice mathematically. There we go. That's some of that. Can I just confirm that uh, that screen is looking good and we still have a, a strong link? Yep. Fantastic. So what have we got? We've got a cylindrical container. It's filled with equal volumes of N different liquids. So I have a friend who makes jam and uh, she made some jam. I think it was like a, like a traffic light. So they're three different colours. So you can imagine this, but then we've got N uh, in this particular thing. So they are immiscible and they've got densities, which are uh, density one row, twice, three times, etc. All right. It's so the lowest one. It's got N row is the density. So you can imagine a sort of stack of these. OK. And you've got a curved surface of this cylinder is A. So first thing we're going to do is draw this thing to try and make some sense of what's going on. So here we go. Here's our sort of uh, set of cylinders and the enclosed here. So we've got um, each one, each layer is of height H. So I always think unpack the problem. And if this is your first session for BFO round one, um, one of the best things you can do for physics um, before you start to write any numbers down particularly is try and draw a diagram to try and unpack what's going on and label all the useful things. So H is the layer of this layer, is the height of this layer. Uh, G is acting on this. All right. OK, um, so there we go, because the first question involves an expression for the force F1 on the area surrounding the top layer in terms of um, the density, strength of gravity, H and A. So this is in a gravitational field and uh, we're going to have another one here. There we go. That's another H. All right, something like this. And we can keep going. Let's have a third one. And then you can see the pattern. All right, so we've got a little pattern here. So we can do a dot, dot, dot. And right at the bottom layer, here we go. That's H as well. All right, so we're thinking, hmm, this is a, this is a progression of densities. So two row, three row and n row and then we've got a formula for the sum of the first n numbers wow this is turning to a math fest today so um clearly we've got some sort of uh, arithmetic progression that we've got to add up so something's going to involve there so there's our there's our sort of situation and right so what do we think about this so um can you just firstly give me an expression for uh, fluid pressure for a column of fluid of density rho and uh, a height h for me please So if I just draw one in the margin, so if I'm if I'm sort of here, if I say that P is zero here and I want P at the bottom. OK, and I'm sort of sitting at the bottom of this sort of tank. 
I imagine I'm in space or it's sealed at the top. That's hide H, a density row. Right, so what's my pressure? What have you got, Kim, now? We've got row G H. Excellent. All right, so we've got the weight of a column of fluid. A quick derivation, I think, is a nice one, given this is our warm-up. All right, so um, if the cross-sectional area is A, right, the mass of fluid is going to be the density times A times the height, right? And therefore, the weight is going to be uh, that times the strength of gravity, rho A, G, H. So the pressure is the force over area. So the pressure is going to be rho A, G, H over A, which gives me rho G, H. All right. All right. And the good news about that is that um, it doesn't matter about sort of how thick that layer is. So we can have all sorts of strange looking shapes and we just need the height of that liquid column for rho GH. Right. Anyway, let's have a little look at this. Now, I guess there's a bit of a gotcha in the first part for this. So what we want is give an expression for the force F1 on the area surrounding the top liquid in terms of rho GH and A. So if you think it's um, it's going to be sort of rho GH at the bottom it's going to be increasing from zero. So it's kind of uh, inside it. So it's on the area. So the area, uh, that's the curved area of this is the cylinder. So actually, I suppose I've been sort of um, A and the other one is the actual bottom. It was the curved area we're looking at. So that's a bit of a gotcha, I think, for this question. So if you think about it, as we go through our layer, we go from zero pressure to rho GH at the bottom. So the average fluid pressure in the top liquid and I think I'm going to draw this out just to be really clear here. So um, I guess this is probably what you could lead you astray potentially for this question. Here's our sort of uh, our, our, uh, our ring of fluids, as it were. So that area there is A, all right, which would be 2 pi R times H. Um, I don't think we need the radius of this one, but if we did, that's what that would be. All right, so A is going to be, if you imagine on like a sort of, um, most sort of things you have at Christmas, when you make chains out of paper. Uh, so if that's H, so H times two pi R is gonna be our A. So I think the fluid pressure for this one, so the average fluid pressure, pressure of a rouge, fluid pressure, all right, in top liquid is a half rho GH, okay? So if you like the midpoint between P is zero at the top, and rho GH at the bottom of the first layer. Okay, so there we go. So what's F1 going to be? Well, it's going to be the fluid pressure times the area A because it's going to be pushing out. If you think about it, the pressure is going to be like the force is going to be acting in all directions. So you can imagine the sort of uh, you know pressure, you know, pushing out in all directions. So what's that going to be? The total force will be F1, which is going to be rho half rho GH times that area. OK, so there we go. That's what's pushing. All right. It's all in balance, of course, but that's what the sort of force is pushing out. OK, um, so question two or part two. All right. And let's just put a box around this one. It says, what is the force F2 on the surface surrounding the second down uh, from the top in terms of F1? So if you think about it, let's just express that. So what we've got, we've got F2. Well, we've got the pressure due to the top layer. So rho G H. And I always think it's quite a good idea to sort of write out what these terms mean. All right. OK, um, because we can always do sums on it later, but sort of setting up the equations is what makes, I guess, physics difficult, or occasionally difficult. Um, and so then we want the average pressure in the second layer. So um, I wonder if you can put that given what we knew for the first one. Um, and given how the density changes, uh, can someone write uh, an expression for, or can write in the chat, for what the average pressure in the second layer is going to be? All right, what am I going to write here? We've got um, rho G H. Yes, because it's a half times two rho times g h which is rho g h okay good so there we are uh, so if we add that up what have we got we've got rho g h plus rho g h which is two rho g h 
a multiply by a because we want the force okay right so we've got a pattern that we're doing here so now we've got to try and generalize what this might be so part three it says uh okay and in terms of f1 i suppose we could do it that way couldn't we so uh we've got so therefore uh what we got so f2 is going to be for f1 okay um so if we kind of generalize this now let's see if we can do that so there we go so i i i so what have we got we've got fn um, a quick question where did the half come from right okay so just going back to the very first part right because i think this is where the gotcha could possibly come in because we're not thinking about the pressure at the bottom of the layer of this one it's the average fluid pressure in the top layer so if i if i so if i say what's there if i just look at the top one if we were sort of looking about this point here right that's going to be pressure is zero we're going to you know relative to the atmosphere at the top or it's sealed something like this the pressure at the bottom is p is rho g h and so we're looking at what is the force acting on that sort of curved surface area so if you think about it, it's going to range linearly so um effectively we could integrate this up if we really wanted to uh, but it's going to be the average of those two things all right so if you look at the sort of average of this top cylinder what is the pressure well that's a half rho g h all right and if we want the sort of you know the average pressure times the area is what there's the force f1 okay for that part so that's that's why it's a half it's the sort of average fluid pressure in the top layer okay i'll sort of highlight that okay all right so if we use the same kind of argument as we did above <laughs> so fn what are we going to go to well we've got the area and what we've got is we're going to sum of all the sort of layers above it all right so that's going to be rho g h plus two rho g h plus and we've got remember n minus one layers above okay uh do 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 yep yeah. okay so there we are so what we've got that for that bit there i can sort of um write out so that's just like the pressure due to the first or the top rather the top n minus one layers right because we're in the nth layer OK, and then we can add to that a half uh, N row. All right. Because that's the density of the nth layer G H. So that's the average pressure in the nth liquid or the nth layer, ignoring what's above it. <laughs> Let's just add that. OK, ignore what is above. OK, so we had the nth layer on its own. Its average pressure would be half n rho gh times, okay, and then the multiply by the area to give you the force. Um, so there we go. Now, all we need to do is tidy that up, okay? So we've got a bit of math to do, and hopefully, we've got an arithmetic progression. So, what am I going to take out? I'm going to take out an area, I'm going to take out of rho gh, and uh, what have I got? I've got one plus two plus three plus all the way n minus one. And at the end, I've got n over 2. OK, so now I've got uh, my little formula for my arithmetic progression. So if I can just maybe move this to the side, I hope that will give you a bit of clarity for this one. So what have we got? Let's just look at the bit in the bracket. So we're, gonna, we're in maths land now. Uh, right, so what is that? So we know that the sum of the first n numbers, right, because we've been given that, it's a very nice little proof, Okay. All right. Equals a half n n plus one. Okay. And um, the uh, uh, actually, we'll, we'll we'll have an opportunity to prove that in a moment. Just uh, so uh, I'm feeling in a mass vibe going on this evening. <laughs> um, but let's uh, let's let's just use that. So this is that's what we're we're given in the question. All right. Um, so what am I going to do? I can say well, f n is a rho g h. All right. And I've got the sum of the first n ones. So I've got a half um, and that, so, uh, that's the first n. So what we can do is uh, we've got, do, 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 um, yes. So what we could do is we can kind of increase it uh, to, I'm just thinking, what have I done here? N plus one, and do, 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 that, look, that looks fine to me. Yeah, so um, what we've got is um, half n, n plus one. That's up to the first the first n, 
and then we've got um, uh, minus n over two. Yeah, that's good. So we've got uh, um, we've got sort of uh, n over two minus one. So minus n over two. Uh, yes, that's all right. Uh, yes, that's okay. Um, so there we go. So n over two minus one. Just think, have I got that right? Was I n minus one there? Just double checking. I think I think I've got that right. So um, there we are. So if we expand this out, what have we got? We've got, uh, if we take out half here, we've got a half A row G H, and we've got, uh, if we expand that little quadratic out, we take out the half, we've got N squared plus um, N minus N. All right, so we then have a quadratic equation, which is F N equals a half A row G H N squared. All right, which is rather lovely. So if we plot that as a little graph, we're going to have a quadratic equation for n. So one, two, three, four, etc. There's Fn, right? The force on the um, you know, the area of the the, the nth nth bit of fluid. And it goes up like that. And there we are, something like that. Um, and it'd be nice to actually sort of prove uh, that little arithmetic sequence. Uh, does anyone know what the uh, what you do? What the trick of that is? Can you pop that in the chat? How can I prove the thing that I've got in the uh, uh, sort of <laughs> multicolored ring here? We've got proof by induction. Oh, we could do it that way. There's an even simpler way. Uh, so proof by induction is a nice fancy method. But uh, does anyone know what the, the, the simplest way of doing it is? It's reversing the list and dividing by two. So it's yes, like two excellent. Excellent. So if we say that uh, S of N is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus all the way up to N, and we can write that in reverse, but we sort of are careful how we write it. So N plus N minus 1 plus N minus, I've done this, I'll, make, I'll expand it out a little bit. <laughs> so 1 plus 2 plus dot 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 N. So we've got N plus N minus 1 plus dot 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 1. All right. So we have 2 S of N. That's going to be 1 plus n for the first one. And then we've got 1 plus n for the next one, et cetera, all the way 1 plus n. Every term is 1 plus n. OK, if we add those two up, if you use to draw some bars on it, this sort of segment the whole thing out. All right. So therefore, what you've got, you've got uh, 2s of n. All right. The sum of the first n terms is n times 1 plus n. And all we need to do is divide by 2. Nice little party trick there. OK, excellent. So no fancy maths required, just by reversing. So there we go. Um, there we are. I hope that's um, that's that's nice and uh, nice little diversion. So there we go. I think the only gotcha there possibly is the very first part, which is where we want to get the half. So otherwise, I think you would rather sort of disappointed you'd be out by a factor of two. But um, I think you'd probably get at least three marks for that if you wrote it out nicely, if you'd said row GH. Um, good. OK, so there we are. That is that question. Anyone got any questions um, on anything so far? Um, please let me know if anything goes too small and I can zoom out. I'm trying to get a sense that you can see everything on the screen uh, that is still readable. Any questions? There's um, don't you need to do it in terms of F1? Oh, uh, is that what it says? Oh, sorry. Yes, of course. So what we can do is um, so F1 we said was uh, was half row GHA. Yep, well, well spotted. So we've got uh, half row GHA. So it's going to be, um, therefore, F1 is going to be, oops, sorry, Fn is F1 N squared, which is rather lovely. Okay, there we are. All right, and we saw that before. So uh, an F2 is 2 squared times F1. So there we go. We can kind of guess what that might be. OK, right. Next one um, on my list, I've got uh, S, so something rather different. So, again, we're going to start sort of, uh, there we are, keep going through. Right. And again, the best way of having a look at this. So um, obviously, this could be a nice experience for you if you've done it for the first time. But I'd really recommend printing these questions out and having a go uh, for an hour or so uh, before this session. And if you've got it completely right, you can feel fantastic. Uh, and if you haven't, you've have you know you struggled a bit. This this will help you give you a bit more revelation about what to do. 
I think that'd be a much better way of, of doing it rather than going at it cold. So um, if you get a chance, um, print out these, uh, these, uh, these, these, these papers. Um, again, I'll, um, if you think, where do I get this from? I'll give you a link at the end. So um, S, we've got a binary star system, 2,140 light years away. OK, and it's got two stars like the sun and there's a separation in light years. All right. So what kind of diameter of a telescope do we need? So this is, I guess, a kind of bit of bit of knowledge here about the idea of the diffraction limit. Uh, but it's more commonly known as somebody's criteria or criterion. Um, it's not a sort of a, uh, maybe if you've not studied this, if you are uh, not a sick former, this might be a new thing. But for sick form particularly in the upper sixth, uh, what, whose criteria do we need to use for this one? And what is it, in fact? While you're thinking, I'll draw a little picture. Uh, we've got Rayleigh's criterion. Yes, absolutely. So uh, what is Rayleigh's criterion? What have we got? Um, not much yet. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, let's 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 draw a picture and see if we can sort of get through these things. So here's my telescope. All right, my uh, highly artistic telescope here. And the point is, it's got an aperture uh, of diameter d. All right. So think about this. Could be a big mirror, could be a huge refractor, that kind of thing. But basically, something which is going to gather light. Uh, so um, completely not to scale, but we've got two stars here. Here's one star, and here's another one. And let's have them slightly smaller blobs, I think. There we are. All right, so these are my stars. Okay, illuminating nicely. And their separation, let's call that X. So there we go. So X is uh, is my uh, 0.0593 light years. Uh, let's have R as the distance away from that one. Uh, so let's go and have that. So that's going to be R. All right. Okay, and we've got X, which is their separation. So hopefully you're thinking, ah, this is geometry. We've actually got a triangle here, a very small angle. Let's call that delta theta. That's what we always do when we have triangles. So we've got an isosceles triangle, basically. Uh, you know, we could redraw that if you like. There we go. So that's x, the star separation. Uh, the height is r. Okay, and the angle is delta theta. Right. OK, so uh, now R is going to be rather large than X. It is. OK, so 2140 compared to 0 0.00593. So if that's the case, since R is much, much bigger than X, we can do a small angle approximation. All right. So that means that sine of the angle. Um, well, it's basically it's, it's like an arc. All right. We can think about this as an arc rather than a triangle. So we can think about it is approximately looking like this, okay? And that means if delta theta is in radians, so if delta theta is in radians, if anyone's from my further mass group, we literally just met this. <laughs> so uh, hopefully uh, that's you'll know exactly what it is. So that means, uh, um, uh, you know, we've got, you know, so pi radians is equal to 180 degrees. So if delta theta is in radians, then sine theta is equal to theta. Arcs are the same as that sort of length, etc. So that length, that arc length we've got, all right, is going to be uh, r delta theta. So, uh, so r delta theta is approximately x. That's the key idea. All right. So rather than doing things in degrees, arc lengths are the range times the uh, angle. Okay, if angles in radians. So, OK, so we got that and we're trying to tune the diameter of the telescope. Well, OK, well, what this tells us is what delta theta is. So delta theta, the angle we're, thinking, we're interested in, uh, is approximately x over r. If we put the numbers in, that's 0 0.0593 divided by 2140, which is about 2.77 times 10 to the minus 6 radians not a lot really tiny angles remember our telescopes are quite large and very precisely moved so let's look at our radiant our, our Rayleigh criterion so we've got we've got light um, coming through this all right and we're going to get a diffraction pattern because we've got an aperture here so um if we look at the power that we get versus angle right from the light that's coming through here 
we won't just get like a, a spike where the, where, the, where the star is. We'll get something which looks a bit like this. OK. And if you do a bit of you study diffraction patterns, uh, we can actually work out what that is. It's a sort of uh, sine x over x kind of thing. Not quite like that, but it's very close. So the idea is the peaks diminish um, in amplitude. So this would be power. I know per square meter, the flux of light from our star, something like that. And this is angle. So that will be from, say, star number one and star number two. So if we sort of focus on star number one, which is this one, and uh, star number two, I can move it. It will be a little bit of another angle. The Rayleigh criteria is when the peak is just over the first minima. So I think well, I'll just do that in a separate color. There we go. Uh, so we want over the minima. Uh, I want that one there. So there we go. Let's, let's have a peak over this one. All right. So there we are. Okay, something like this. All right. Um, let's just move that. Oops. Move that out of the way. All right. So if those are the angular separation of the light, so the, if you like the diffraction patterns. All right. From each uh, star, you can imagine the stars are point object. If that angular separation is less than the separation between the first minima and the maxima, then they will just look like one star. So if we call that delta theta, which is the same delta theta we're interested in here. Right. So that's star number two. And that's star number one. OK, and this is a diffraction pattern. OK, so to just resolve. Resolve the stars. So in other words, they appear as separate, distinct stars. We can look at two diffraction patterns rather than just one sort of blurry one. Then the Rayleigh criteria says that delta theta is approximately 1.22 lambda over D. Now, you may have looked in optics if you study these things that uh, lambda over d is the first minima approximately uh, for one of these. And the 1.22 comes in because it's a spherical aperture. And to actually work that out, you've got to do some quite fancy maths called Bessel functions, which we'll do at university. But essentially, it's approximately lambda over d, uh, which is well within the realms of available stuff. So this is for a spherical aperture. I suppose we could talk about a circular aperture, really. <laughs> I'm going to use the word circular if that's all right with you. Uh, let's actually pronounce it properly. There you go. So, OK, I'll leave that as an interesting uh, conundrum of why it's 1.22. But yeah, that's that's a good bit of knowledge. But factually, lambda over D, and I'm sure we'd give you all the marks if you said that. So there we go. So to resolve the stars, uh, we can put those two things together. So what do we got? We've got uh, delta theta in radians is X over R. And we need delta lambda is, uh, well, it's going to have to be uh, bigger than this. All right. So uh, so to resolve. All right. So delta lambda must be bigger than 1.22 lambda over D. We could call this the diffraction limit all right, of our telescope. And of course, you can use this not just for telescopes, for our eyeballs or any kind of thing, which is, uh, you know, in, 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 we've got sort of any form of waves which are enter an aperture, you know, it could be sound waves, could be uh, light waves, gamma rays, anything like that. All right. This will give us our, our res resolution criteria. All right. So this is um, uh, OK. So, so, oh, this is, so OK. So what we've got, um, if we put the numbers in, we've got X over R is bigger than 1.22 lambda over D. And what do we want? We want D. So that's rearrange that into in, uh, that's uh, inequality. So D is bigger than 1.22, right, uh, times uh, lambda. All right, um, uh, and there we go. So uh, I'll just put those in. So lambda R over X, all right? And of course, R, uh, that's one over R, R, the angle that we, com that we computed at the start. So there we are, let's put the numbers in. So we've got, therefore, our diameter is bigger than 1.22, times our wavelengths. Now, what light are we talking about? There we go. If you're using visible light of wavelength, well, you should have that yellow. But anyway, <laughs> let's go for 550 nanometers. So uh, let's have a look. So we've got 550, uh, 550 times 10 to the minus 9 uh, times R. And because we've got R and X in light years, we don't need to convert it. So we've got our R is going to be, uh, what did we say that was, 2140. 2140 light years. 
Okay, and we're going to divide that by uh, x, which is going to be 0 0.00593. 0 0.00593 light years. I've left the units in so you can see that they're cancelling out. Right, I don't need to convert that. Um, and now, of course, the nanometers, I've ought to have put units there, really. Let's do that. That's in meters. So that's lambda. All right. And if we put that together, I make that about 0 0.24 meters. OK, so what a reasonable, you know, uh, that's quite a large, you know, a large telescope, but that's not, you know, outrageously large. You know, it's a sort of kind of the expensive thing that you could get in a in an astronomy shop. It's not sort of 24 meters or something mad like this. OK, so something an amateur astronomer could probably achieve. So with an amateur uh, astronomer, could, I'm, I'm no <laughs> astronomer, by the way, but um, that's quite cool, isn't it? So you, in principle, you should be able to resolve this. Um, any uh, just actually an, anyone who's an amateur astronomer on the, on the call who's uh, who's seen some good stuff with uh, with their telescopes? So the school I work at, we have an astro sock on a Monday. So if it's nice weather, they go outside and uh, look at things. But here we are. You might be able to actually see two stars that are 2,140 light years away, which I think is rather impressive. OK, do we have any questions? Am I still broadcasting? <laughs> yes, you're still broadcasting. Fantastic. Right. OK, so we're going to change tack now. I'm going to look at one that's uh, question C. Uh, if you've had a go at this one, let's just zoom out here. If I'm going to zoom, there we are. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Right, here we go. So uh, we're going to go from the grandest possible scales uh, of astrophysics uh, to uh, you've just left your astronomical observatory and you're about to cycle home. And uh, so this is all about what's going on there. So there we go. Uh, we're going round a corner. This is all about circular motion. This is going to be about classical mechanics and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so um, if you've just been studying some circular motion, uh, this is the question for you. All right. And if you haven't, um, this is going to incorporate some moments, uh, Newton's second law. So this is a classics mechanics problem. So firstly, we want to draw a diagram. So we're going around a corner and we're leaning our bicycle. So uh, let's uh, let's have a sensible coordinate system, which is at the wheel. So there we go. Let's have a coordinate system like this. And here's our cyclist. All right. So cycling like this. And uh, I think we can have some handlebars or something like that. All right. And I think the centre of mass of our system, let's have that there. All right. Because we want to know where the weight's going to act. And our game really for all of classical mechanics is drawing with the forces on these things. So let's have our forces in purple. We've got the weight of the centre of mass acting. And that's mg. So let's have a cyclist of mass m. All right, and it's at 12 degrees to the vertical. Let's call that theta. So we know that angle there must be theta. And uh, the cyclist is going around the corner, leaning into the corner, right? So uh, let's have, let's sort of assume that there, the center of rotation of that, uh, that turn, if you like. So let's go and draw this. So if we were to a top down view, right, the cyclist is kind of going around the corner, all right? And the cyclist is going a velocity V, all right? radius r circular motion so this is top down view so i'm just trying to explain this problem in uh, in pictures really so this is the sort of circular section so the cyclist might not actually be uh doing a full circle but at this point it is all right so we can think about the center of rotation of the turn okay so i said note this is the circular section so um the turn is a small section of a circle of radius r okay right what else do we know so let's uh, let's have that radius r in our diagram there we go so that radius is r what else do we know well we've got must have some reaction force going on here let's pick a purple one so our reaction force is at the point of contact and that's going to be r okay what else do we know uh well all right, so that's leaning across. We might want to sort of have some, uh, there's going to be some turning moments. There's also some friction as well because it's on a road. It's not going over ice. So there must be a friction force acting that way. And if you think about it, the, 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 the wheel is pushing against the ground. All right, here's the ground or the road. Let's go for a road, shall we? 
Uh, so all right, so the friction force is going to act towards the center of the circle. All right, it's going to oppose the pushing force of the um, of the cyclist. All right, we might put some coordinates in here as well. Let's call that X and that Y. All right, we have a coordinate system so we can describe this. And I hope you can see that there's a turning moment here. So about the point of contact, the weight of the cyclist has a turning effect. So it might make sense to actually have the sort of distance of the center of mass uh, from that thing, because that's how we compute moments. Now, that's not in the question, but that's something that we might want to refer to later. So all these sort of hidden variables, if you like, um, uh, come from thinking about the diagram. So I think we've pretty much got everything now we need. Um, might also be useful to talk about the velocity. So the cyclist is going around the corner. So in this sort of frame of reference, if you like, there's the speed and the cycle, that means into out of the page, out of the page. OK, so imagine we've got a kind of this X, Y plane is the, where, you know, this is the um, this is the X plane here. So that's the X axis. And the Y axis is coming out of the plane in this picture. All right. OK, so that's our setup. Um, so what have we got? Well, our goal now is to kind of try and relate these things. We kind of want to see what, what angle would they lean over if they went around the corner a bit faster? So we've got to relate all the things in our diagram together. And really what we want to do is relate the angle uh, to the things we know, which is the speed. All right. And that's what we know. OK. And we also know the strength of gravity because that's acting. G 9.81 newtons per kilogram. So basically uh, our goal, it might be worth if you're only doing this for the first time to state what our goal is. So we want theta as a function of our inputs. So what do we got? And that's going to be V and it's going to be, um, and do we have a, well, that's interesting. We don't have actually a, a um, uh, our, uh, our range here. So we need to sort of this literally V and G. OK, and uh, that makes this make slightly harder because we don't know what that is. However, we do know that we know that the relationship between 10 kilometers an hour and 12 degrees. So if we divide one by the other, we should be able to sort of cancel out the, the range. OK, so um, we need to. To cancel. R. All right. So that's all right. If we have an expression in terms of R, it's going to be the same uh, for the two speeds. Right, so let's go and do this. Let's write down some stuff we know. All right, so let's do Newton's second law for the moment. Can people type in what Newton's second law is, please, um, in the chat? The little slightly tilted 11 means parallel to. Okay, what have we got? What's Newton's second law? Equals MA and also uh, DP, DT. Yeah, fantastic. So I like to say Newton's second law is mass times acceleration is the vector sum of force. Um, if we say so F equals MA, it's sort of like, well, we've already got F in our diagram, but there are other forces. So it immediately kind of gets rather confusing about what F might be. So I recommend thinking about this in words. So Newton 2, all right, there's also a country song about this. Uh, you can go on the Eclecticon and, uh, and have a listen to that if you so wish, uh, which is, and that is the chorus, believe it or not. So mass times acceleration equals vector sum of force. And it's really important when you're doing mechanics um, is to sort of work out what your vector sum of forces, literally add the vectors up. All right. And that's going to equate to your mass times acceleration. So and, and do it that way around. So you can kind of separate this, this way. You don't forget any forces. So in the X direction. So when we do the vector sum, we can think of our forces adding up in the X parts and the Y parts separately. So in the X direction, what we've got is our force F. All right, let's use the right direction. And we've got one form of acceleration. Now we go around the circle, so we must have a centripetal acceleration, which is V squared on R. Now that might be new for a few of you, hopefully not so new for many of the others. So mass times acceleration is MV squared on R. So V squared on R is the centripetal acceleration. That's a nice little proof. We won't do that today, but uh, that's a really good bit of knowledge um, to have a look at uh, if you have not met this. So circular motion, if we're going around a circle, the square of the speed divided by the radius is the acceleration towards the center of the circle. And we need to have acceleration because our velocity vector is changing as we're going around the circle. 
we call that the centripetal acceleration. And circular mo motion problems are basically involving this idea. We might also have met as r omega squared, where omega is uh, 2 pi divided by the period. OK, or alternatively, um, you could sort of, uh, you know, you could sort of think about the V is going to be uh, 2 pi R divided by the period. Go around the circle so you can you can relate them as well. So V squared over R is the same as R omega squared. I'll put that as a little aside. OK, anyway, we just need V squared on R for this one. So this is the first one. Number one, uh, let's do Newton 2 for the Y direction. So what's that going to be? Well, there is no force in the y direction um, uh, because it's not accelerating. All right. It's in equilibrium. So it is in equilibrium. So mass times acceleration is zero. Now, what's going to be the vector sum of force? Well, let's look at our diagram. We've got R going up in the y direction. All right. And we've got mg going down. So that's nice and straightforward. So the reaction force must equal the weight. No surprise there. Right now. Uh, we're assuming that there's no rotation about the center of mass. OK, so we're not in equilibrium. We're accelerating, but there's no torque. Right. There's no angular acceleration. So um, if we look at the turning moment, so the turning moment is the same as the torque, the net turning moment. Right. The sort of force times distance, the perpendicular sense from the pivot. Um, if that was not zero, we'd have some sort of angular acceleration about uh, O here. All right. So if we do that, we can generate a third equation. So we looked at Newton, too. Uh, this isn't really an energy or a momentum question, so we can't really incorporate those. It's not like a bouncing thing. It's dynamics. So the only thing else we can do is look at moments. So, um, OK, so if uh, if no rotation. About uh, O, which is the point of contact, well, instantaneous point of contact. <laughs> with road. Then what we've got, uh, so we can say there's no net torque. So total torque, right, or turning moment equals zero. So zero. And let's, uh, we need a direction for our turning moments. So what we want is the force times the perpendicular distance of that force from the, from the axis. So we can use this distance h here. So what do we got? Uh, we've got um, uh, so we've got uh, uh, R times no um, R times H sine theta, so H sine theta is that distance, okay? And we are well, and it's interesting here. Here's an interesting one. So yes, we can sort of like to do it in terms of about that point. But remember, because it's an equilibrium, uh, we don't we can choose any point we like uh, from this. So actually, um, I'm going to do about the center of mass. Because if you think about it, you know, we're not rotating it at all about the center of mass. So actually, I'm going to do it about. So I'm going to take moments about the center of mass. So take moments about the center of mass. OK, um, because uh, we need F involved here. All right, because F is involved in equation one. So if we take our moments about uh, O here, that's going to be a bit of a problem because we won't have F and R. So actually, we want to take the moments about the center of mass. So let's go and do that. So what do we got? We've got R uh, times H sine theta. All right. So that's going to be R times this distance here. Or alternatively, we can resolve R in the sort of perpendicular sense to the, between O and our center of mass and multiply that by H. So either way. All right. So R sine theta times H or H times R sine theta. Let's do that. So R H sine theta, that's the turning moment of the normal contact force about the center of mass. And we're going to take away uh, F H sine, sorry, cos theta. And I might need to zoom back out so you can kind of see that. So F and the distance between the F force and the center of mass is going to be R uh, H cos theta. All right. So it might be easier to sort of think about uh, um, uh, the angle here, so I could have that distance there, right? So that is 90 minus theta. This is going to be theta. All right. Uh, so F cos theta times H 
is going to be the turning moment the other way. So eyeball that for a few seconds. Um, and hopefully you can kind of see that. So um, if that's true, then that's rather nice um, that the H's cancel. That distance doesn't actually matter, which is quite a powerful thing. So let's put that together, shall we? So um, this is equation three. So this is our turning moments. And if we do that, H cancels. And so what do we got? We've got, um, therefore, uh, F cos theta equals R sine theta. And if we rearrange that, what have we got? We've got F equals R sine theta over cos theta, which is tan theta. OK, so that's quite useful. Um, and now let's see what we've got. So we want to have uh, uh, we've got um, R is equal to MG. So let's call that equation four. So what, else, what do we know? Let's just quickly summarize. So we've got R equals the weight from equation two. We've got MV squared on R equals F from equation one. And then we've got F is R tan theta. So let's put those things all together. And hopefully that gives us what we want, which is theta as a function of V and G and R. All right. But remember, ask the same for both those speeds. So let's go and do that. So what we got? So we've got uh, um, m v squared on r equals r tan theta, and then we've got r is mg. So m v squared on r is going to be mg tan theta. So therefore, what have we got? Well, the mass cancels, which is rather lovely, and we've got um, v squared on r is equal to g tan theta. All right, which um, uh, has cropped up in all sorts of other circular motion things that we've met. So um, all we need to do is uh, is basically, so all right, if I divide both sides by G, I've got tan theta there, and it's the angle we want. So um, if we have a little look at our data here, what, have we, what does that mean? So it means that V squared over tan theta equals GR, all right? Um, so GR in our case is a constant. So if we do a ratio between uh, the speeds we want, just remind us what the speeds are, 12 and 15. So if I put this here, so I've got sort of uh, V, uh, is it 15 kilometers is what we want? Uh, yeah. So V, uh, 15, all right, squared on GR is equal to tan. And we're told that is, well, that's the angle we want, isn't it? Yeah. So tan theta. And what have we got? We've got uh, V... Uh, is it 12 degrees? So um, so V12 squared over GR. We don't know what R is, but that's it's the same for both. And that's going to be tan of 12 degrees. Uh, yes, I think that's okay. And V squared in this particular case is 10 kilometers an hour. So if we divide one by the other, uh, the GRs will cancel. So we've got V15 divided by V12, all squared. And we've got uh, tan of theta. Um, divided by tan of 12 degrees. And there we go. We've now got an algebraic solution to what we want. So if we rewrite this, so we've got tan theta is tan of 12 times the ratio of our speeds. So uh, there we go, 15 <laughs> over 10. So 15 over 10. Okay, they're, as long as they're the same, same units squared. And we just need to inverse tan this. So uh, theta is going to be the inverse tan of tan of 12 degrees, right, times 15 over 10, 1.5 all squared. And if you put that to a calculator, I make that uh, 26 degrees. I hope you do too. Okay, so there we are, a little recap. I'll see if I can sort of uh, distill any of the gotchas here. So the first thing we did is we drew a nice picture where we have the center of mass. Uh, am I still broadcasting, by the way? Can you still hear me? Fantastic. So yes. we've got the centre of mass of my bike, uh, mg. Uh, we've got a point of contact. We've got our reaction force and our friction force. Uh, we've invented a distance because we know uh, maybe from experience that uh, we need to do a moments question. So we need a distance in order to sort of write that out. And don't be afraid that we've created some things that we aren't mentioned in the question, like the distance to the centre of the circle and the kind of distance from the centre of mass to the point of contact. Don't worry about those. those. Those will cancel. You've just got to sort of take it on trust because we know it's a circular motion problem. So a circular motion problem. All right, we've got a coordinate system, so it makes sense. Uh, we then sort of uh, written down Newton's second law uh, for this problem. All right, for X and Y, uh, incorporating our centripetal acceleration. 
And then uh, we said, OK, well, it's, it's not a statics. It's in dynamic stuff, but there's no rotation about the center of mass. Um, and uh, I suppose we could have no rotation about O, but there's no rotation about anything. In fact, about COM as well. So you might think, well, maybe we'll take moments about uh, the point of contact, but actually that doesn't really help us. So in this case, uh, we'll take moments about the center of mass instead. And it doesn't matter because um, there is no torque. So it doesn't matter where we take moments about. OK, so I guess that's a little nice trick that you might want to think about. Um, and then it's just putting the equations together. So any, any, more, any questions on this one here? Uh, I think there was a question that, um, so if you do take moments about O, why does the weight not provide a net clockwise moment? Oh, um, right. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, do, 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 do. So that would kind of imply it's not. Oh, that's a very interesting one, actually. Um, let's have a think. So R, ah, now, is this where we have, that may be actually taking moments about O, that's not a problem, because I think this might be, because it is not in equilibrium, of course. So the total turning moments in this particular frame, because it is actually accelerating. So I think we have a little subtlety here, which we'd have to incorporate. So I think in this particular case, you definitely, so maybe actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a cross through this. So I think, I think actually, I'm not sure this is going to, I think that might be a bit of a misnomer. So in fact, we want the center of mass instead. So I'm gonna put, I'm gonna cross that out and I'm gonna say this one here, because yes, you're right. It would imply that we would have a turning moment about this one. OK, so uh, yes, so that can't be in equilibrium, but it isn't in equilibrium. <laughs> right. OK, uh, anyone other, any more questions? This is the one we need. One more. Uh, could you re-explain why, this, you know, the cyclist may not accelerate uh, angularly? Right. OK, so um, I think what we're doing is we lean over at an angle. So I suppose there's two parts here is that um, you could say, well, OK, uh, what situation would I be in? We're assuming there is an equilibrium. The cyclist is, is, is in that kind of dynamic equilibrium. It's not. It is like in the frame of reference of, uh, I guess, of the you know, some of the accelerating frame of reference. The cyclist goes around this, the corner. Um, uh, that angle is preserved. We're told that. And so if that is the case, then we can't have any net talk about the center of mass. <laughs> Flipping that around might be a bit more tricky, you know, because in principle you could go over. And if you, you know, I'd, I'd recommend not doing that actually on a bike, but uh, you know, you have to set things up so you are indeed in, in that sort of dynamic equilibrium. Um, good question. Right. Okay. Uh, before I open more Pandora's boxes, uh, let's have a look at uh, what have I said? H, which I think we tried to do last week, which is about the rocket. So we'll finish with a bit of rocket science. Uh, H, H, G, H. There we go. Right. So if you want to have a little read of this. OK. H, H, H. There we are. Aha. Right. So this is rather a fun question. Uh, um, I think sort of playing with water rockets, I reckon, got me into university. Uh, so the rocket, which is spelled like this. Right. Uh, right. If you've not seen this, it's rather brilliant. It's basically a bit of kit. I think you used to be get it from the Science Museum and you screw it onto a one litre water bottle. Um, all right. It's got some fins on it and you pump it up uh, with a pump. You put about 300 mil of water in and these things can go uh, about 20 to 30 metres per second um, in the thrust phase. The water comes out in about, I don't know, a 0.3 of a second and they can go up to about 30 to 40 meters maybe more if you're lucky but not sort of it's not a scary rocket you can do these in schools um they're great anyway so uh what have we got we've got a rocket which is a bit heavier than my water rocket here we go here it is and uh here's my rocket blasting off what are we do about five minutes right okay so here we go all right so we've got some thrust let's put a force on this uh, and let's have, uh, you know, my person in the, in the capsule. There we are. So uh, ignoring air resistance. All right. So, um, you know, let's assume that is quite small. That's probably quite a bad assumption, actually, initially in the atmosphere. But let's just ignore that. Um, and we'll also ignore that G changes with atmosphere. So we're going to ignore air resistance. Ignore drag. We're going to assume that G all right, uh, changes with altitude um, much more slowly. All right, so we're going to ignore uh, some of that J. G is a constant. All right, okay, obviously G does decay considerably. It's an inverse square law as we go up higher. 
all right? But we're going to ignore that, all right? Because that's going to be a long way, hundreds of kilometers. Um, right, so let's work out the thrust applied to the rocket. So basically, this is the rate of change of momentum. I think we had that uh, before. So T is the rate of change of momentum. So that means, uh, what do we say? We said once the fuel ignited 50 kilograms per second, let's call that mu, is expelled downwards at a speed of 2000 meters per second. Let's call that C, shall we? Uh, a big C, something like that. Um, so what we want to do is the, so 50 kilograms, the mass times the, the speed change, if you like, uh, that's going to equal mu C. That's going to be my thrust. All right. So the mass flow rate times the speed that it moves. OK, uh, so if we put that into a calculator, what do we got? Uh, actually, we don't need a calculator for this one. It's going to be 50 kilograms per second. And we're going to multiply that by 2000 meters per second. All right. And we've got uh, 50. Uh, we've got 10 to the 5 kilogram meters per second uh, squared, which is uh, 10 newtons, 10 to the 5 newtons. All right. So 100,000 newtons. Right. Part two, what do we got? So um, it says find expression, sorry, find it for the acceleration of the rocket in terms of total mass m, t, and g. So let's use Newton 2. Mass times acceleration is a vector sum of force. So what do we got? We've got the mass of the rocket plus the, uh, the initial fuel mass. And in t seconds, we're going to take away a mu t amount. So this is the mass of the rocket. And we're going to multiply that by acceleration. And that's going to be our thrust, but we also have the weight. All right, so we've got the weight acting on our rocket minus mg. Okay, so if we rearrange that, we've got A is T over M minus the strength of gravity. All right, that's nice. That's, and that's, that's part two. All right, let's have a look at part three. OK, so uh, what does it say now? So it says, OK, find expression of acceleration as a function of time in terms of all the other things. Well, we've kind of just done this, really. So really, it relies on the fact that the mass is the initial mass minus um, mu, our fuel ejection rate, or whatever we want to call it, times time. So if we just rearrange that, that's going to be A equals T over MR plus M naught, OK, uh, minus mu T minus G. Now, uh, it's told us. Uh, 50 kilograms per second, do, 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 and T not the time uh, for which the thrust acts. OK, so um, the thrust acts. What we want to do is we really want to talk about how much mass uh, that we, we do this. So let's have a little look at what we've got. 50 kilograms per second. Uh, so, uh, oh, yeah. So 5,000 kilograms of fuel. Um, so what we can do is we assume that it gets rid of all the fuel. I think that's uh, do 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 fuel to fuel. Does it say that? Um, well, the total time for which the thrust acts. So there we go. Oops. So the total time for which the thrust acts, we assume we're going to burn all the fuel. I guess that's a fair assumption, isn't it? So T naught is the total uh, fuel burn time. Okay. Uh, so in other words, that means. Therefore, my fuel ejection rate, mu, is m naught divided by t naught. OK, I suppose you could sort of argue that, well, maybe we don't have to burn all the fuel, but, uh, you know, this is a rocket going up. You know, why would you carry all this extra fuel? <laughs> you want to get as fast as possible. So there we are. Um, so uh, we can write this out as t divided by mr plus m naught minus m naught t over t naught. All right. So now we've got masses. Uh, for all these things. All right. And minus G. OK, so that's our third part. All right. So now if we actually have a little look in the astronauts frame. So it says calculate the time after launch, which the weight of an astronaut on board will appear to double. So we kind of need to sort of think about what that means in terms of our uh, our astronaut. So let's uh, have a little look at that. So IV. So in uh, our astronaut frame of reference. OK, so let's have a look. Here's our nose cone. There's our astronaut, uh, hopefully strapped in. So what sort of uh, what do we mean by the weight here? Well, obviously, there's going to be uh, gravity acting 
mg, but there will always be some normal contact force acting on the astronaut as well. All right, so if we do, and uh, remember, the, the whole thing is accelerating, acceleration A. All right, so let's just do Newton 2 here. What's Newton 2 in this situation? Well, I'm obviously going upwards, all right, because that's the only direction we care about. So mass times acceleration, all right, because the astronaut is accelerating, um, because he's he or she is actually strapped to the rocket, A equals the vector sum of force. So there's a normal contact force pushing against the astronaut minus the weight. Okay, so it says... Uh, the weight appears to double. All right, so the weight appears to double. So therefore, we can incorporate that. Well, how do we experience weight? You know, well, if we stand on a mass balance, we get a force pushing back at us from the springs of the mass balance, and that's what we record as our weight. So weight appearing to double will mean a doubling of our normal contact force. So that's the key for doing this. So our weight in terms of gravity isn't doubling, of course, all right, because the strength of gravity is deemed the same, but the weight appears to double actually means that r is equal to 2mg all right so we've got a doubling of our normal contact force all right okay so that's nice and easy now so uh, what we can do is therefore in this particular case uh, so we've got um, ma equals 2mg that's going to be what r is minus mg so therefore, MA is MG, therefore A is G. So therefore, A is G. OK, so there we are. So we're accelerating upwards at the strength of gravity. Right. OK, so if you do that, what we want to find is how, what the burn time is. So if we incorporate both of those things. So therefore, uh, right, what do we got? We've got we've also got an expression for T as well. We know what that is. Um, so we know T is 10 to the 5 newtons. And if we rearrange that, what have we got? We've got, so therefore, if A equals G, we've got uh, G equals T over MR plus M naught minus M naught T over T naught uh, minus G. Let's just rearrange that. So we've got 2G um, equals this lot. All right, if we cross multiply, we've got the masses. All right, MR plus M naught. Let's make that a bit bigger. Minus M naught T over T naught. All right, uh, equals T over 2G. All right, uh, so if I move this all to this one side, uh, minus T over 2G M. Oops, 2G. All right, that's M naught T over T naught. Right, I want to multiply by T naught, divide by M naught. So what have I got? I've got uh, T naught, all right, the sort of uh, the burn time, if you like. And I've got MR over M naught. I've got a one here, because M naught over M naught is one, minus two over two G M naught. All right, and that is equal to my burn time. So let's put all those things in. So I'm, we're told, oh, my pen has just died. Oh, am I still there, guys? Have I fallen out? It's still there. No, it's still, oh, there. still there. Good. All right. Well, nearly there. So please persevere. Thank you. Uh, right. Let's just pop that. There we are. Fantastic. Good. My pen's working. Right. So let's put that together. So what have we got? T naught, I think was 100 seconds. Yes. So there we are. Let's just work it out. So we've got M naught divided by T naught equals 50 kilograms per second. Uh, so uh, with M naught is 5,000 uh, kilograms. So therefore, um, what have we got? So um, M naught divided by 50 is T naught, and M naught is 5,000 kilograms. So T naught must be 5,000 over 50, which is 100 seconds. That's worth just doing the margin, I think. So uh, we had T, which was uh, 10 to the 5 newtons. Right, and I think we've got everything now. So therefore... Uh, T naught, uh, so that's 100 times um, MR, which is 5,000, I think it is. Yeah, is that right? So MR, the mass of the rocket, is 5,000. Yes, 5,000 rocket and 5,000 fuel. We've got the same amount of fuel as the rocket mass. All right, so that's nice. That gives you 5,000 over 5,000. That's 1 plus 1 minus 10 to the 5. So 2 times 9.81 times M naught, which is 
5,000. And that's equal to T in seconds. And if you put that all in together, it's just under 100. It's 98 seconds. So there we are. Nice little question there. OK, it's not too bad. Let's put that all together. So um, there we are. Just in recap, uh, we've got a nice expression. The mass ejection rate times the relative speed is the thrust of a rocket. Um, we've got Newton 2, um, but we've got a mass which varies with time linearly where we've got so we're removing mu kilograms per second, 50 in this case. Um, and then we can sort of do dynamics if we wish. Uh, we're looking at this one, which is saying, OK, at what point does the acceleration equal? Um, well, does the weight appear to double? So at that point, the acceleration is the same as G. And our key kind of principle here is our perception of weight is the normal contact force. And it's trying to understand limits on the normal contact force is how you do these problems. If you look in an elevator that's falling, for example, in the frame of your elevator, you've got your normal contact force and weight. So if you are weightless, then R is zero, all right? Because the whole frame is falling at G. So that's kind of what you mean, really. Um, I guess in your frame of reference, of course, you know, we, we can talk about the sort of being in equilibrium as it like you're effectively weightless. But the way to look about this, I think, is that you are accelerating. So Newton two applies in the way that we've written, and it's understanding what's happening to your normal contact force is the way to kind of think about these type of problems. Um, and then it's just a bit of algebra to the end um, to find out what T is. OK, um, I hope that was fun. Uh, sorry, a, bit, a few minutes over. Um, do we have any final questions before we go? Um, no, I don't think so. I seem to have uh, dealt with them. Marvellous. Right. So next week, um, I think we'll probably might be maybe one or two. That there, there's a few more left for, for 2022. I'd recommend the optics question. We'll definitely do that. We've not done the optics uh, yet, apart from that little thing with uh, uh, the Rayleigh criteria. Uh, so next time, uh, let's have a look. So the optics question is uh, it's on Snell's or T, definitely T. That's good fun. Um, and I think it'd be really quite good to do Q, which is a strange little question, but very, very nice, very short, which is about springs. Um, and there's a very nice question. It's a little harder, but it's a lovely mechanics problem. Not too dissimilar to what we've just been doing, but it's a little bit more trigonometry, which is L. So if you fancy a challenge, L is really good. Uh, but if you can have a go at T and you can have a go at the other optics question, which is, um, uh, yeah, so T is the optics question. All right. I'll see you all next week.